If you're somebody who gets the chance in life to change people's lives, I don't think you could ask for much more than that. How many people have the ability to change people's lives? Like, how do you... How many people have that opportunity? How many people would even take that opportunity? For me, it just happened. So much together, high highs and low lows, everything in between, over and under the stormy weather. You have brought me back to my knees. When I'm stuck in my head, it's a dangerous place. Not responsible, no good, for much of anything. Thank you, sweet darling, for stepping in my path. Thank you for helping me to unload the weight of changing everything. Oh, I love my calves. This is one of the best things I ever did. Probably the craziest, because we almost went under doing it, but I love the cows. They've, they've been an amazing addition. And it's funny because, you know, up here in cow country, you tell people you raise pigs, they just kind of shrug at you. <laughs> Chickens, ducks, geese, turkey, they don't, they don't care, but now some of the old timers are actually starting to talk to me because they've heard what I have going on here. Come on. Come on, baby. This mom's got twins on her, and they're feeding. She looks like an airplane. She's got one on each side. The two twins right here. Come on, guys. That's the little boy. He's so good. That's pretty much when they're the, the happiest, as you can see. And you'll see they're not moving. When there's good grass, they don't move fast. Good grass, happy cows. When I started this, I really had no idea what I was getting into. I think I had some idyllic visions, like most people do of what farming is. I left Wall Street, which I thought was a pretty uh, intense place to be, and have come to find out that farming is even more intense than working on Wall Street, and there is a lot of Wall Street in farming. <laughs> As I found out what was going on in the state of agriculture and trying to survive as a little farm, I found it really hard just as a normal person to kind of sit on my ass and just be a unwilling participant. So what I do uh, is on Mondays, I send out an email and get into some of the positive things that are going on with the farm. And Thursday and Friday is when my next emails come out, and that includes what food I'm gonna have, so I know people are paying attention. So what I get to do is I get to kind of hammer them in the beginning with whatever has happened over the course of the week to give me fodder, which is usually a decent amount, where we're reaching out to, you know, 3,000 people, and I have people who 
have been on the list for just about all of the 10 years who definitely chastise me and try and keep me in line for what I write. But I've checked in with a lot of scientists and a lot of GMO labeling verification companies and, um, and I follow the USDA sites. So I catch on to a lot of things, but a lot of what I do is just based on the reality of what's going on out there. When I got out of college, my buddy started calling me and telling me all this money you could make working on Wall Street. So my wheels started spinning and I actually came up with a plan that it was basically my four year plan in and out. After swearing for my entire life that it was the one place I wouldn't work, I ended up spending 12 years on Wall Street. I was the sales manager at my firm. I was in the city for September 11th. With everything that happened there, family members and losing a lot of people that I knew and spoke to every day. I lost my brother-in-law, who was my best friend. It was just kind of crazy keeping everybody under control and people coming to the office with life rafts and parachutes and whatever else. To be an American and go through military checkpoints every day kind of can really start wearing on you. So after a year of just kind of bouncing around down there trying to figure it out. It wasn't much fun anymore, so I just bailed out. I left everything and moved back to my house that I grew up in. And when everybody asked, they said, what'd you do? I said, I watched the snow melt. And I really did for like three months watch the snow move across the lawn a little more. Then one day I said, you know what? I think I'm just gonna buy some chickens. I'm gonna get a few ducks and some geese. It was good therapy for me. I think it really just helped me get some focus, get my brain back in gear, and just kind of gather my wits. We had a little farm stand in front of the house. Then it just started catching on. More people started coming. Before I knew it, I was sitting in Pound Ridge with 450 chickens, turkeys, ducks, geese, guinea hens, and I decided I wanted to go upstate and buy a cow. <laughs> I looked around this area probably for three straight months and couldn't find anything that matched the beauty of this place. So after looking at 12 places one day with my real estate broker and future wife, I said, just look what's up in Cambridge. And then we came up here, we looked at the farm up here, and I loved it. And then from there, I, you know, I encouraged him, and here we are. 
You make it seem like it was so easy. <laughs> it actually was so easy. Really? Yes, it was. How many farms did we look at before? About a dozen. A dozen? No. We did a dozen in one day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was really looking for somebody to talk me out of it in the back of my head. I thought it was a great idea, actually. <laughs> He said, you know, why don't you look on the internet, type in Cambridge, New York, because he had seen this place. His brother had lived here years ago. We came up here every single weekend while he was working at the, the Cambridge Hotel. We wanted to buy the place, and they ended up selling it out from under us to a developer, but then he went bankrupt. So he sold it to a lady whose husband used to write Hitchcock movies. He died and she wanted to move back to England, so we drove up here three hours. We got a four-wheeler from next door and I took her down in the woods and I shut the four-wheeler off and I said, just look up. And then I knew I had her hooked. <laughs> I envisioned the storybook farm with just like a few chickens and ducks and it was the excitement and the fun and the innocence of having no idea what we're about to get into. Rarely do you get to do something stupid twice so without really looking at the infrastructure part I said sold. And that's how we ended up here. When we walked on this farm years ago, it hadn't been a farm in over 50 years. The place was shot. We had no idea what we were doing. We probably made every mistake that two people could make and learned everything the hard way. But in, in some ways, I'm glad I didn't know what it would be like. I feel like if I had known what it was like, I don't think I would have ever wanted to do this. The barn is exactly 726 feet from my house. The reason I know that is there was no electricity when I got here. I put a cable in there because I figured I'd be spending so much time in the barn I could watch TV. The roof was leaking. My neighbor had an old above the ground pool he never put in. I stole it from him. And that whole roof is a in the ground pool cut in half. <laughs> I know all about hydraulics now, diesel engines, electricity. <laughs> On Wall Street, I knew about ordering lunch. I could do that very effectively, but no, you, you have to learn it. It's, it's survival. You would, you, you'd go broke really fast. We're going to pretty much repair, put the windows and stuff back. Got to make it nice for the hay. <laughs> That should last about five days. <laughs> We're just kind of checking them to see if they're dry, fully dry. If the hay bales aren't dried properly, they'll mold. Um, and mold is obviously not a good thing for the cow to be eaten, and nor will they eat very much. They'll eat it, but they won't be happy. and. Um, whereas you want them eating at pretty much the most optimal level that they can. It's good insulation for the pigs when the winter rolls around. First year I didn't have any hay up there, it was like a wind tunnel. We 
we're gonna have 462 round bales up in there, which is over 115,000 pounds. And the rafters, nothing's even bending. So they did know how to, to build barns back then. When I was a kid, I, you know, I wanted to be a farmer. You always saw farmers with those wrinkled hands and busted up knuckles and their shirts a mess and they have that dirty stained hat. But, you know, you can look into their eyes and see their soul. I wanted to be that guy. This is Rachel. And when she was young, maybe about a year old, she taught me how to handle cows properly. Because I was trying to move her and she knocked me on my ass and gave me two stomps. You got yours, you are done? Always another one waiting. <laughs> We run what is considered an integrated farm as opposed to like a mono crop or mono animal type farm. So it, it, during the course of the day, you're running through dealing with small chickens to pigs to cows. You have to deal um, with each differently. And the morning starts with the chickens first. People may not think this about chickens, but they do get to know you, and there is a reason why they say that people can be henpecked. If you bend over to pick something up, they'll jump on your back, and they are more social, I think, than people really think. five days ago turned 11 years old. They are like having very, very bad children. There could be a turtle sitting on a log. The geese will go by, look at the turtle, and boom, knock it off the log into the water. Like, that's just how they behave. The cows are probably the, uh, the prima donnas of the farm. They definitely have an air to them. Your dealings with them are 100% on their terms unless there's work to be done with them or tagging, which then they are not very forgiving. And they have no trouble popping you out of the way if they're going to get water or anything. You are just a part of their thing. They're not, they're not part of yours. Uh, there they come. Come on, girls. You know, our morning chores end with the pigs. I've been through a lot more with the pigs than I have with any of the animals, so there is a little different bond. Pigs are very close to human. It's something I think people really miss. There are times when the pigs get up and they're grumpy. It's all hell. Come on, fat lady. Come on, fat lady. Come on, girl, let's go down. Come on. 
I wanted to raise the Berkshires because of all the information that I found out about them. So I basically, for three months, badgered the president of the Berkshire Association to give me one of his boars. And he had a buddy who brought me my breeding stock. This is actually how you know that a mama pig is gonna be a good mom, truthfully. When, when you can rub her belly, look at what she's gonna do. She's gonna lift up and expose all of her boobs. And that means she's gonna be a really good mom when the babies start bugging her boobies. She's gonna be a great mom. I don't know what you're gonna be except trouble. But we first got the pigs and they first came to the farm. So the guy pulled up with a big trailer full of pigs and he got there. We didn't have any fencing up. We didn't have anything. And he just looked around and thought, <laughs> I could only imagine what he was thinking. Along with that breeding stock was a catalog of all kinds of drugs with all the things highlighted of what I needed. And so I went out and bought about $600 worth of drugs and was all panicked about when piglets are born, they cut their teeth and they cut their tails, which I thought was kind of a pretty awful experience for me and for the piglet. And how was I going to do this for years and years, litter after litter? I don't know, I'm not gonna bring in no apples. I'm bad, I'm bad. So it just didn't seem like a program that I would be able to do long term. Then I went through pretty much every single feed company in western Vermont and eastern New York, north and south, almost to the Canadian border. I had every feed analyzed and there was immature canola and sand. I got a load of feed from Cargill once. The guy couldn't understand what I wanted, so he put me in touch with the big wigs out in the Midwest. What's this ingredient? Animal protein products. Well, that's chicken feathers. I said, you want me to feed my pigs chicken feathers? He said, that's standard. That's our protein that we use. No, scratch that. The next one after that said cookies, and I didn't know if it was a product or something. He said, no, those are, those are you want me to feed my pigs Nilla wafers? That's what they, that's what we throw into the feed. It makes the chicken feathers more palatable. I, uh, 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 I fed it one day to my pigs and I, I felt awful. <laughs> and uh, I dumped it in the woods, three tons of feed, and the deer wouldn't eat it. <laughs> the old man had taught me everything and really is the reason and I'm still here. He raised pigs for 40 years. Like people came from four states to buy pigs from him. He is amazing. Well, we met at the fair. Because <laughs> John was looking for somebody that knew what a pig was, and I just happened to be there with my granddaughter, and she was showing pigs. So when I met Larson at the fair, he said, I don't use anything. And I said, oh, okay, that's a little bit more up my alley. I like nothing. <laughs> I can do nothing. They live just fine. <laughs> and, uh, and it's real crazy because they all lived fine yep. and everybody uh -oh. is healthy. They're rubbing up against me. <laughs> there hasn't been any problems. It was only all these mysterious things happening when we ran into bad feed. I had a herd of 30 sows. Uh, I figured I did about 600 baby pigs a year just before things went south. If you work with feed companies, they don't have the facilities to check every bit of corn that they get in for mycotoxins, so they have no idea it's there. He's obviously being a little more polite. This corn was basically pulled right out of the field and not dried down. It went pretty much from field to uh, being ground and put into feed. Mycotoxins are formed by mold and they're poisonous to animals. Everybody sort of had the same problem all at once, so everybody knew something was wrong, and most of those people are, do not have any pigs anymore, so yeah.
Everybody's just like me, basically out of business. Nobody ever says they're sorry even. Or calls back. Or calls. You can say that. <laughs> yeah, they don't call back either. Yeah. If you're bitter, the only person that hurts is yourself. It doesn't hurt the person that you're bitter against. They could care less. So why be bitter about it? Uh, you, but what it does is teach me to keep an eye on everybody and everything behind me so they can't stab me in the back again. <laughs> but why be bitter? It's tricky feeding time. I don't even know how many different feed companies before we said, hey, we have to come up with our own stuff, with our own formulation, with our own of knowing every single thing that goes into the feed. In the old days, they just used regular grains and stuff like corn and wheat and tankage and linseed meal, legume, hay and stuff like that, and oats. This is my book that I've been using for doing feeds, and it was copyrighted in 1956. It might be an old book, but not much has changed. They still have the same vitamins and the same minerals that the animals need. And uh, John and I have been using this book to make up our formulas, which are better than a lot of the big companies' formulas because they like to take shortcuts and they use poor ingredients. It's not rocket science, it's starting with just the best ingredient. I mean, my guys look at me funny all the time when, you know, when I'm eating a feed or I'm tasting the feed or... It doesn't matter if you're a person, a cow or a pig, your, your stomach is your first, your first line of defense. Feeding time at the zoo. If you were to smell this, you would smell the cinnamon in there, you would smell the garlic in there. There isn't a hormone, there isn't an antibiotic, there isn't any kind of hey, thing to promote growth. It's a super duper old fashioned common sense approach to raising the animals. And that's lunch. on this farm in 77 and we started the grain business in 1990 and uh, we started grinding corn selling whole kernel corn cracked corn first and we started into making people start asking us to make feed and stuff like that and we've always been non-gmo ever since we started so we're our fails we're to make a load of feed while everybody else has switched over growing gmo corn Stayed with conventional corn, and this may come as a shock, but his feed business is booming. <laughs> People come from three, four different states. I think he's probably the only one within hundreds of miles that makes feed with all non-GMO ingredients. Years ago, we used to think 500 pounds a week was a lot. And now, you know what, I mean, 500 pounds, one person is buying 500 pounds. It's just gone crazy, it really has. And people are starting to learn that non-GMO products are good for them and good for their animals. John's one of our, on the bigger side of our customers. What's going on? Oh, gosh, morning, John. We're ready to yeah. make some feed. Oh. All right. Yep. How come you're late? <laughs> I'm always late. So round one, we're just loading in the corn, um, which is the base of the food. And uh, we'll get it on a scale and then whip around again until we get the right amount of corn in there. 
And all our formulas are like 1950 formulas. We're loading soy into the payloader. We've had them roasted here probably a week or so ago. So they're still nice and fresh. And then we're going to be dumping it into the gravity box. That will mix vitamins. Uh, this is all organic vitamins and minerals. And then we offload it uh, into the little red wagon. These guys, they sell feed in 100 pound bags to small farmers. You know, I'm the only one that shows up for three tons of the pops. My vitamin guy tells me I'm a one percenter. <laughs> that there's only one percent of the people that he knows in all of the farms that he deals with that who could even come close to feeding my animals the way I do. I think that genetic technology is an absolutely amazing and beneficial technology, but it sure as shit isn't good for your food. I mean, there's a million uses for it, and I think in the future, uh, there's, there's a lot to GM technology, but certainly not in people's food, man. That's just, uh, you're, you're playing with fire. I don't care how you slice it, you're playing with fire. Friday afternoon starts our markets weekend. It's basically making sure we get all our orders and all the products down in the markets. This is kind of the bulk of um, where the farm makes the money to pay the bills. So we're trying to just see what people are gonna want down there. There's tons of people that come up and just say, what do you got? This is my bacon pride and joy cooler. This is. Uh, this is my special bacon. We call it special bacon. Uh, this is center cut Berkshire belly. Some nice packages of short ribs. Uh, two people were asking for porterhouse. Uh, the old fashioned square burger. Good old days. When I first started farming, I didn't jump into this to save the world. I really just wanted to taste burger meat like when I was a kid. The small farm business model is not really based on a business model, it's based on a way of life. A small farm can thrive, a small farm can feed people, a decent amount of people, and you can create health, you can create well-being, you can create community. What's up, buddy? How you doing? Good. We were talking this morning about burger meat. Oh. Where's burger meat comes from? Brandy, you got your hand on this? Yes. Dear, dear lady over here. There you go, dear lady. <laughs> I told you, I'm mic'd up. I got to behave today. I know. Hey, can you use these as a fan? <laughs> <laughs> uh, John actually grew up around the corner from where I live here in Palm Ridge. And uh, he's gotten known around town as uh, the guy who went from Wall Street to, uh, you know, digging his hands in the dirt. He's just determined to get good food into the community. You can see by the lines that are here every Sunday morning that people are really uh, signing on. Romaine, no, head, head lettuce, no. is that good duck? The Giggle Twins. The Giggle Girls. 
Somebody. Go on. That's cool. Amazing. Real. Jackson is 10 years old and loves John Boy's products, right? Yeah, they're the best me in the whole world. They're the best me in the whole world. Jack Jackson has autism, and when Jackson was three years old, I changed his diet to to give him no dairy, no grains, no processed sugars, and only organic, non-GMO foods. As a result of that, he's, he's improved significantly as a mainstream classroom is doing wonderful. But the food is, is the basis for his improvement. Did you tell these guys what you were talking about? I buy from John Boy because my youngest son um, was, di was diagnosed with some disabilities um, at a very young age. In trying to figure out how to help him best, um, one of the big things I realized after doing a lot of research was that I needed to clear out his food. My youngest son had somewhat of a miraculous outcome. All of his service providers said to me, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. They saw such a huge difference in him. Well, you have an order. I do. I have, a sm I, have I think, um, some chicken parts and some chorizo. I like what John Boy's doing. I have to support it. I used to spend summers on the farm. And those are the best memories I have. I think that the diversity of the small farmer, we need that again in America. I think that's actually at the core of what made America great. The more we can do to support the local farmers, like John Boy, the more sustainable, the better we're all going to eat and get those chemicals out. As a cancer survivor, I, I think what you eat is really important. John Boy is the guy who's caring about our food system, caring about the people he helps to feed. His animals are given so much love. They're fed with the best food, the best grains, and natural farming like it was done 100 years ago, the way it should be done today throughout this country. I usually do most of the cooking because, as you can probably tell, eating is one of my favorite things. Tonight, always is having some Berkshire pork shoulder with a little curry rub on it. He loves curry, has to have his curry. All fresh, you know, all grown nice and clean, and he'll have a nice good meal for tonight. Oh, and they got to. That'll be a good Friday night of some pulled pork. It's pretty hard to beat. <laughs> Both of my parents will deny it, but my parents were not really the best of cooks. Oh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, when John was uh, growing up, he was uh, even fussy about food then. If you cracked his over easy egg and it split open or something, he wouldn't eat it. My mom had uh, hanging out in the back of the house one of those big triangles and she would ring him. Bing, 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 bing. And that's when you knew, like, you had five minutes to get into that house, no matter where you were, or you were doomed. We never had a meal until their dad came home. There couldn't be a phone ringing, there couldn't be a TV on, there couldn't be a stereo on. And I think that's where they got a lot of their, their thoughts from and their ideas from, because we discussed it. It was nothing but your family sitting around the table. Yeah, that's what us three will eat tonight. You can go into any culture, you can go into any country, you can go anywhere in the world, and the kitchen is the center, the epicenter of the universe. Oh boy, <laughs> where should I start? <laughs> well, hon. <laughs> you love your pulled pork. Too much. That's too much. <laughs> Everything about the farm is just bursting with life all the time. There's so many new babies um, between the pigs and the baby chicks and the little ducklings, um, the baby calves. And now we have the most amazing baby of all, our little guy. And that's been one of the greatest experiences for John and I.
One of the reasons I knew he would be such an incredible dad is how much he loves and cares for the animals. I would say he maybe almost goes too far sometimes with the animals. I remember he got a little uh, jacket for the calves <laughs> and put it on the, jack the calf each night. No matter what, the jacket would be off by the morning. So he probably almost goes too far, but they definitely are responding in kind. You're eating some good grass, Baba. That's a yes, I guess. I mean, I've been at this for 10 freaking years. This still blows me away. This still makes getting up at 4 o'clock this morning worth it. Look at him. Holy crap. It amazes me. They amaze me. I think the first time that we ever lost an animal was one of the hardest times. I remember that myself and John and um, the, the kid who worked for us, we sat and cried. It was so hard for us to process. And it doesn't, that part of it doesn't get any easier. If you don't get past that and if you don't accept it, you're out. I mean, that's, you know, you have to accept that you're dealing with living things and nature and stuff doesn't always pan out exactly how you want it. It's the worst day of the week for me. Okay, guys. That's a beauty. Okay. Tie that down. Come on, boy, it's good. Morning, Dwayne. How are you? We don't have a big trailer yet, so this very, very nice man, Dwayne, comes, who's been doing it for a hundred years around here and only travels local and doesn't work on hot days and really cares about the animals. Come on, come on. Get up, get up. Boy, if only they all went that smooth. He won't be processed till the morning. He'll have time to settle in and have a pretty stress-free night with some water and kind of get acclimated, settle down, blood pressure, adrenaline, everything. He'll be pretty relaxed. OK, Bob. Not can get all sentimental when my guys are around here on the camera. <laughs> You have to thank them. You have to thank them for all that they've given you while they're alive. You have to thank them for all they're going to give you as food. It would be a shame to put all of this into raising an animal, then to have the animal actually butchered shoddily or without any respect or without, uh, in a very humane way. So Joe has been taking my animals in since, basically since I've been processing. You would think that somebody that, for better or for worse, kills animals all day would kind of be like, kind of be like a hardened guy, kind of a killer. It's funny, I think he's like the complete opposite. The more calm they are, I think it doesn't stress them out at all. Their adrenaline's not pumping. Commercial processing, they, they know one one thing, you know what I'm saying? Like there's there's 10 guys and they all have one job to do as like when John brings his beef to me, I, I do the whole process. I handle him when he brings them in. I let him, you know what I mean? I keep them overnight. 
people take pride in the beef that they raise around here. And as far as I'm concerned, he's definitely the best around. And his beef are at least two or 300 pounds more than the average Angus around here. You know, everybody always asks me, okay, you're so close to your animals. You know, how can you bring them into slaughter? So, uh, it, it's, it's the worst day of the week for me. I always tell people, it's the worst day of the week for me. But my rationalization is, if I wasn't commercializing these animals, there would be no way that in the middle of nowhere in upstate New York in dairy country that this vibrant herd of Berkshire pigs would exist. Oh God, this camera's gonna be rolling for this. Um, every pig that goes in, I take personally. Um, and, uh, and I have my little conversation with the pig before I close that door behind him. And just the life experience that they've bought is so above and beyond, you know, uh, a pork chop in a supermarket. Like, it's very hard to explain. I don't think most people can understand it, but it, it's, it's an amazing thing, and you're incredibly lucky to be involved in this part of the process. And to be, you know, I'm their caretaker, like their whole entire life, I'm responsible for. And then, geez, you have to justify that I'm responsible for their death. It's a pretty wild balance to make. I would never, like, sell a live animal to somebody. People have asked me to sell piglets or pigs. I, I, I wouldn't even have the stomach to see one of my animals leave not knowing where it was going or who was, you know, how it was going to be taken care of. Uh, so there's an incredible relationship that exists between your animals. It's not just the guy driving around on a tractor. It's not, there, there is an integral coexistence between you and your animals that uh, it, it is beyond a wild experience. I've done, I've done 12 years of research on GMOs, genetically modified uh, organisms. And so what I've done is try to objectively um, disseminate this to customers and people on the list. So let's think about this logically, Farming 101. I am in northeastern United States. I have a certain climate. I have various microclimates. I have uh, different soil structure. I have a whole host of things going on that don't go on in Nebraska, let's say. If I take a seed from Nebraska and I plant it in this type of microclimate, is it going to grow better than a seed that grew there the year before? and grew there the year before uh, and has adjusted as these seeds naturally do to their environment and the climates that they're in. Whereas the farmer who is planting genetically modified seeds cannot save his seeds, has to rebuy them. They are two to two and a half times the price. 
and then has the inputs of the chemicals and fertilizers that gets you into this cycle where you really can't, um, that you really can't get out of. Chemicals and sprays are, have just replaced knowledge. Oh my God, there's weeds in here growing, which is devastating, but it's not. I mean, you know, you'll see in the other cornfields that because there is no weeds, there's a lot more light getting in um, and the soil tends to dry out faster without any cover in there. This corn is growing fine. It's growing without any pesticides. It's growing without any herbicides. It's growing without any sprays. This was planted a little later. It's beginning to tassel up nice, but you don't have to worry about touching the leaves or the stalks. I mean, imagine millions and millions of acres of land that you can grow nothing in but GMO corn. This won't have corn in it for another few years. We'll grow oats, we'll, we'll do farming 101. It sounds crazy, but it's the simple crop rotation. Being able to use seeds that were grown in this geographic area, in this type of soil. Here you have beautiful soil. You know, falls right through your fingers, crumbles, not clumpy, not chelated, not, I mean, I'll keep smelling it. I mean, it just, it smells like the earth. And most of this uh, is really from, from the cows. Um, and it's just really aerated, composted. It's got everything in there. It's ready to plant, like you don't need to augment this with anything. Like we really will put nothing in here other than the seed. It's been weeks since it rained. You're not even showing any sign of stress on these leaves. You'll see some GMO fields that are probably not quite as lucky. <laughs> GMO cornfield, it's beautiful, it has weeds. You only need to look across the street and I guarantee you that there's probably a sign somewhere to be found and, um... Oh, a sign. So tell me the logic of this. Somebody maybe can come and explain to me, you just saw my field, you just saw what was going on, what? the hell is going on here? What is what has changed from my field to this field? Some farmer would probably come kick the shit out of us, but you know, if you if you look those those bottom leaves, I, I, I doubt there's much nutritional value to them if I was to take a guess. You cannot go and plant something in here that isn't roundup resistant. If a, if a bug eats that stuff, the toxin goes into its stomach and makes it explode. So let's say I end up eating that corn. You're trying to tell me that it goes into my stomach and it does nothing? Roundup is an incredibly cheap, cheap, cheap product to make. It has huge profit margins and it really, really contributes to the bottom line of a certain company that begins with an M and ends in an O. I haven't seen the yield being higher on the corn. I haven't seen it do better. So you're stuck with a higher cost of planting, uh, a lower yield, a less nutritional value. They know Roundup is gonna work for so long. Then they know that 2,4-D is gonna work for so long. And then they're gonna have to develop something else that's even nastier than its predecessors. But Obviously, Mother Nature is always going to find some way to get around. How did it used to be that agriculture survived and thrived so many years ago that we used to have the bread basket? You know, now we got the waste basket of America. I really, I would be thrilled to meet somebody who's as pissed off as I am, to be honest with you. I would be thrilled. Could I turn my back on the whole thing? Maybe. 
but I couldn't turn my back on the whole thing. I don't have a choice. I'm, I don't know. It's starting to aggravate me. Uh. We're here today to discuss one bill and only one bill, possible state labeling requirement for foods containing genetically modified organisms or GMOs and the effects that the bill would have should it become law. Well, I'm here to testify uh, in support of the A3525A, a bill that would require labeling of uh, foods that have been derived from genetically engineered ingredients. Unlike other developed countries, the U.S. does not require genetically engineered foods to be proven safe before they can go on the market despite significant safety concerns. Anything that we put into our food should not be up to companies independently to determine whether that's fine or not. That has to be made by an independent authority such as the FDA. My name is Jeff Williams and I work with New York Farm Bureau. I'm the manager of government relations. And uh, the three of us would like to give the agricultural aspect, the agricultural benefit in the side of the story. I'm opposed to legislation that would require special labels for food and beverages that contain ingredients derived from biotechnology or genetically engineered crops. In the United States, we have almost 20 years of experience in the use of biotechnology-derived crops for human and animal food without a single adverse incident. The FDA has declared these ingredients to be of no material difference to conventionally produced ingredients. The 94% of the soybeans and 88% of the corn grown in this country uh -huh. are genetically modified. Uh -huh. That's a fact. We started doing this so we could limit the pesticide applications. And everybody said, that's good. And now but we're isn't it true that a higher use of pesticide is now necessitated? No. No? Well, that's not, that's not what I understand. That, you know, there are more and more uh, crops resistant to um, well, I'm not, the Roundup? I'm, we grow our corn one time we spray. That's it. Uh -huh. One time. One and time? What do you spray it with? We spray it with Roundup to kill the weeds. And you can buy Roundup in any uh, home and garden center. I can also not buy Roundup. But That's if correct. your seeds are all from Monsanto, I need to know about that. I don't know, reprehensible is too strong a word, but I really find it objectionable that the quest for more information is frowned upon, and I think that's because you're afraid of what we're gonna find out. Absolutely not. Yeah, you know, this is really about chemical companies selling chemicals. <laughs> yeah. I always say to people, who, who's in this biz? Monsanto, DuPont, Dow, Syngenta, Bayer. They're, they're, those are the big five. What are they? They're all chemical companies, and they're using this technology to sell chemicals. What are you gonna do? America's gonna be, you know, overrun with these yeah. herbicide tolerant weeds it's going to be a, a catastrophe yeah. but unfortunately it's no way out i mean it's well that that's the whole thing is there really is there's just no way out once you're in the, you know you have to put the sign up you have to yeah. do everything written by the contract or you could you know you could be in a lot of trouble like you try to explain that the cost of your seed could go down from what oh. cost them four hundred dollars an acre cost it me forty dollars actually go down because when you look at it since the since the since Monsanto and the biotech companies have bought up the seed companies, what they're doing is they're stacking more and more traits into the seed. And then since farmers don't have any choice about what they buy, when they put those seeds out, Monsanto has calculated, well, you don't have to spray herbicides on them. The amount of money you'd spray on the herbicides, we're going to add that Was, to, is the, added to the, the cost. price of the seeds. Um, this is the most untested technology out there. We are the only industrialized country in the world that has no labeling and no testing of GMOs. And our government is not willing to do anything. How could you give a company, a person, or anybody any sort of immunity against harming the people of this country? I think people really need to understand, like, this is a business model. This isn't what's good for farming. This isn't what's good for agriculture. It's like, we are a big chemical company. 
we sell chemicals. How do we maximize our shareholder value by peddling more chem chemicals and controlling the seed that is there? You know, big, big farms own big, big subsidies, big, big contracts. And so th the spread of it uh, was like wildfire. So if I'm... If I'm seeing that a big company or a big farm is doing this and I'm a small guy, I've got to try it. I have seen so many farms where these guys wanted to play with the big boys who were planting GMO corn, who watched for years their inputs and expenses rise while their yields came down and the next step is the for sale sign in front of the farm. Farms used to be owned by the farmer around here. Now they're all bank owned. They do not care to give farmers that are raising non-GMO products crop insurance. There isn't an overall growth in small farms producing meat, producing pork, chicken, and otherwise because they cannot compete in this environment and you have to have the fear that some asshole is gonna show up in a black sedan in his suit with his loafers and he's gonna throw a lawsuit on you. There's not too many left in the farming community <laughs> to stand up and do much of anything. No. It's almost all big farms. The little farms are almost all closed down. And that's the way it is. Your only way that you can get good clean food, grown without all of the crap, is to buy it from a local farm. A lot of countries are still dominated by small farms, and a lot of countries, that daily, weekly farmer's market is the center of town still. And that, I think, is what we need to get back to in order to really make change. I manage the market. I select the different vendors. I interview vendors. The color is amazing. We started the market with a core of small farmers that had been overlooked by other markets in the area because they were so small. Then half a pound of beans. And then we brought in other vendors to complement the produce and the, and the fresh meats. Thank you. We have more power than any corporation in America because we have a wallet. And if we all were activists with our wallets, the amount of change would be dramatic. The business model of a small farm benefits the community and, and the local economy of where that farm is located. The biggest issue that you have is subsidies to these big companies. And that is what makes a pork chop so cheap, where this may come as a shock, but I don't get any type of subsidy. Or I would be able to compete in that arena. but. If you do, and this is, this is important, and you're gonna have to bear with me here, but this is important. If you understand where your food comes from and you respect how it is produced, you are going to eat the whole thing and use it and enjoy it and create your own health and well-being. When you are an outsider and you get into farming, and you realize the things that are wrong with it, it's very, very hard to ignore. So you're put into a position where you have to act. Hello? 
Hey, what's going on? Small farms are going to really be the future of farming because I really feel that we are not very far from seeing the big ag business model. It's a business model, it's not a farming model. The big ag business model breakdown. We're steamrolling towards a point. When does it change? We're not a preventative country. We don't, we don't think far enough in the future to have the mentality to be preventative by nature. We are a reactive country. We react after it all hits the fan. And when you're dealing with things like agriculture, which can take years and years to recover, we are steamrolling to some major, major problems. For what? For maybe five, six, ten corporations that are dictating the policy for 314 million people? Like, are you out of, are you out of your mind? I was getting kind of to the point where I was a little bit tired of doing so many markets. Uh, two double egg sandwiches, please. And wanted to kind of put everything in one place and have more convenience other than people being able to buy, you know, my stuff only once a week, that um, I opened the outpost. Mm, it's good to have some vegetables in there, really too, good. right? Yeah. It's so beautiful, huh? It's just kind of another phase in how the farm and the people and everything we do has taken me. Here, are you going to come in today to get them? Okay, how many would you like? The legs and thighs are separate. How are you? All right, good. What's up with you guys? Are you having French toast again? You are? She's a long way. And what are you having, boss? I know you're the boss. It's beautiful here. Thank this you. is my first so time in here. Oh, is it? Yeah, I love What it. he's trying to bring to the people is basic, very clean food, very clean living. People come into the store and just ask him to do things, and the word no is never in his vocabulary. I like these organic flour, man. No, we don't, we don't use that in the house. The he flour definitely right says, here. I'll try, before I say I can't. And that's, that's what he does. Thank you. People come from New York City just to get five minutes of his time, just to talk to him about what does he think they should be doing? What does he think they should be feeding their children? Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, that's. I'm that's allergic part of it. to everything except his food. <laughs> He's got a lot of people on board to change the way of, of living and eating and cooking, for that matter. This is our home away from home. We do not eat out. It's this is our this is it. I mean, we come here every weekend, and it's an extension of our home. Yeah, we've gotten to the point where we pretty much, you know, can't even think about going out to eat any place because we cook better at home than we could ever eat any place else. I was in danger of, of having to go on blood pressure medication. So I was eating factory-raised meats, and I was ingesting genetically modified vegetables and fruits, which are loaded with pesticides. And when I started learning how he was treating his animals humanely, 
I immediately got very involved. And when I changed my lifestyle and my diet to good, clean food, which John promotes, I felt far healthier and then far happier. You know, having a child on the autism spectrum, we've noticed a big change in behaviors and just changing up the foods and taking the stuff out that does not belong there. It's less medical bills to pay for, and my son's living proof of this. We both are. What we need to do is solve the problems of small farms, and that's what I feel is like a huge part of my mission. We need to address feed costs. We need to address processing costs. We need to address distribution and getting into markets. We need to address these issues, and we need to strengthen the small farm in rural America so we can maintain rural America. Farming is a way of life. It's not a business. It's something that is in your blood and you stay with it no matter if it's thick or thin. So many of these guys, it's not thick or thin, it's how much money I'm gonna put in my hip pocket at the end of the week. Some of them don't even step in the field. They sit behind a computer all day. They don't milk their cows. They hire people to milk their cows. They're not really farmers, they're businessmen. They go to the office in the morning and come home at night. I had a guy yesterday talk to me and I told him I never went to work a day in my life. This isn't work. When you enjoy it, you're not working. I would encourage people to farm with the understanding that this is not like becoming a lawyer or a doctor. This is not about having as much money. You know, listen, in my previous life, you know I did something else. I spent 12 years on Wall Street. This is a massive adjustment for me being relatively poor. <laughs> You know, when you take all my political bullshit out of it and everything that I ramble about against the system, you know, the basic part of farming is a pretty wild thing. It's an adrenaline rush. Pigs. You can't beat pigs. It would be like the equivalent of jumping out of a plane every single day for the rest of your life. That's how I would put it. They can keep you pretty balanced, even when you spend a day tracking down politicians or doing something stupid. It, they can really ground you. They can, you can look in an animal's eyes and say, it's all right, it's okay. One of the best things about farming is that it really touches you on a primal level. You feel a sense of satisfaction and a, a sense of connection to nature and to the land in a way that I don't think I've ever felt before. The farm didn't lose its meaning as my son took my time. The farm gained more and more of a significance in my life. My son kind of illuminated everything that we were doing here. But my son also made me realize that we have so much more work to do. 
I can't leave my son with something worse than I got. I need to leave my son, we need to leave our kids with something better. There's a little boy who's hardly even talking but really pushing me as hard as he can for me to make things, for me to make things good. So much together, high highs and low lows, everything in between, over and under the stormy weather. You have brought me back to my knees. When I'm stuck in my head, it's a dangerous place. Not responsible, no good, much of anything. Thank you. Sweet darling for stepping in my path Thank you for helping me to unload the weight of changing everything Oh, Not long ago some people got together Tried to start up a new country Somehow or another they lost their way Thought God and money were the very same thing Many came along to try and fix the situation Many have been shot down in the street They woke up that morning and looked in the mirror Started with themselves by hoping to lift the weight of change Say if it ain't broke, don't fix it Sorry to tell you that you're wrong When there's nothing left that's broken Then we won't have to sing this song And in a way, there's only one thing you have to change Everything Everything 